So as you can see, somewhere in chapter 15, I forgot my book and I'm too lazy to go to my office. Do you want mine? That's fine, I don't need it. Okay. So I don't know what page. If you want to volunteer, you can. There's a table in chapter 15. That table summarizes the four main eras of US healthcare. So, uh, <coughs> 252. Okay, it's on page 252 of your textbook. Thank you. So, if you understand that table, your second midterm questions involve the main eras of US healthcare. So, if you understand that table, you just have to skip through the rest of the chapter to save you some time. I think they just provide different evidences, statistics under four different eras. That's about it. They just elaborated on the four eras in the body of the text. So I think in your midterm, your second question, if you understand that table, on page 252 very well. You should be fine. Are we clear? So, regardless of what era we are in, and sometimes different countries, not only in the US, they go through these four eras too. They may not call it the same way, but they go through these four eras in almost a similar pattern and regardless of what eras we are in accessibility whether one can get easy healthcare access affordability whether one can afford healthcare and the quality of care is always influenced by the government usually through various regulations the market forces and other professional norms of the medical community. So, I think in every country, they go through the stages of development from maybe underdeveloped country to a developing country to a first world country. I think all countries go through this cycle in different time periods, in different time frames. Now, Cambodia, Laos is going through the developing phase while many first world countries, Europe, America are in the first world country category. So because of that, the extent of the influence of these three factors affects accessibility affordability and quality of healthcare in different ways in different time periods as different countries they go through the four or three errors or five errors some scholars politicians practitioners they divide their healthcare into three errors some healthcare practitioners some policy makers in certain countries divide their errors of healthcare into six errors, five errors but regardless of the, the number of errors they are influenced by these three factors the government through different laws and regulations the market forces demand and supply how they determine the price of different healthcare services different treatments and the number of people needing all these treatment services, demand and supply. And professional norms are different. Medical committees in different countries operate differently. Medical professionals in different countries, they abide by different value belief systems. So professional norms differ from country to country and the extent of government regulations, market forces, professional norms in influencing the three aspects of healthcare, they can change over time. As 
the country move from one era to another? Are we clear questions? So according to your textbook in America, the first era is the professional dominance era. It's around the time of World War II until the early 60s or mid 60s. Under the professional dominance era, people regard the discipline, the field of medicine as sacred, noble. They regard medicine as a specialized knowledge, limited to a few, inaccessible to lay persons. These were way before the times of the internet. So maybe it's harder for people to get literacy in this domain. Internet is gone. It's not an option. And maybe somebody has to have some kind of literacy, some kind of educational level to understand healthcare, to understand different medical terminologies, to understand what's wrong with them. So in this era, medical knowledge is only limited to the health professionals, the medical community. And this era, professionals, government and even lay persons, the general public, assumes that the medical professionals, especially doctors, are going to abide by the Hippocratic Oath where everything is going to self-regulate like the Parsonian conception from the healthy state to the state of being sick then to the state of recovery everything self-regulates and all these doctors, nurses, medical professionals they are going to perform their duty with integrity because of that everything is going to self-regulate questions about this era But after that, people find out that if doctors, they have their own private practices, independent private practices, there are disparities, vast disparities among all these private practices. And sometimes this can lead to excess in the number of services rendered by all these physicians, professionals. And maybe there are some other areas within medicine that's in need of maybe more treatment, more physicians in that area. So there's a waste associated with the professional dominance area. And because of these two assumptions, medicine is noble, medicine is specialized, doctors medical professionals will abide by the Hippocratic Oath. So because of that, there is a lack of accountability to anybody who is not a medical professional. Patients are passive recipients of all these treatments and diagnoses or prevention procedures. Patients were not empowered during this era. And we all know, right after World War II in America, your country prospered during this time. So federal and state governments or even local governments, maybe they had more resources. Right after World War II, America became a strong nation, surpassed England or many countries in Europe. So America had more resources. When government at different levels had more resources, they think maybe it's not so fair that we are not involved in medical practices, in healthcare decisions. They want to be involved. So because of that, they instituted or initiated what? Medicare and Medicaid in the 60s. And because of that, there is an institutional change 
from the first era to the second era. Literally, the medical community were being quote and quote forced to change when government got involved. They had more resources. They say healthcare decisions should be a shared control between clinical professionals and people who are in charge of operations. They want to be involved. And the second era is not perfect. The second era, we also call the Federal Responsibility Era. From the mid-60s to the early 80s, they are not perfect. Even though people got subsidized or free healthcare, but there are problems with that era. Because of the second era, subsidies or free healthcare, it creates healthcare inflation. And so people want change again, the government, the private sectors, especially employers who pay for employees insurance, they want change. People want a more cost-effective way to do healthcare. Because of that, it gives birth to a more integrated delivery system. In the third era, the second era is not perfect. People want change. So, they or Americans enter into the third era again, in the 80s. Healthcare is even more integrated in the third era. Among private insurance providers, now they got involved. Private employers, they also got involved. Among the medical professionals, they have been involved since the first era. And the government, they have been involved since the second era. Healthcare is more integrated compared to the second era. And we also have the Clinton Healthcare Plan of 1993. And this healthcare plan focused on managed care. And we will talk about what is managed care in the next slide. And under this managed care era, there are more H and O booming. There's an increase in the, in the number of H and Os. And there are more and more providers networks emerging under the managed care eras. I'm sure you heard of the term out of network, in network physicians or providers. They came about under this era. And because of the healthcare inflation, now the third era, managed care era, focus on for profit goals. And because of that, employees have less options for coverage. They don't get to choose their providers so much. It limits the option under this era to be cost effective. And again, the third era is not perfect. As you can see, as we can see from the first three eras, patients are passive recipients of healthcare. They get their information from doctors. It seems that they trust the professional judgments of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, other medical professionals. They are passive, essentially. So this is another limitation associated with the previous three eras. The lack of patient engagement. Patients are not actively engaged or involved in the prevention diagnosis and treatment process. A big limitation of the first three eras. So we need changes again. And because of that, there's a lack of accountability, not towards the government this time, towards the patient. And there's also a lack of evaluation. We don't know how the medical professionals are doing. Have they been successful in Preventing infant mortality, we don't know. 
they are not tabulated. Doctors, nurses, pharmacists, they just render their services, give prescriptions. We don't know people get well or not. From all these prescriptions, we don't know patients get well or not. We don't know if mortality associated with maybe heart diseases, pneumonia, improve or worsen over time. Nobody collects the data. So people figure, we need some evaluation. Let's collect data. Let's focus on data collection in the incremental improvement era. This is from year 2000 until now. We are under the incremental improvements era. And because of that, many universities, they have a new major called health administration. Essentially, they are evaluating and assessing how medical professionals are doing their job. That's what they study. In health administration, they learn how to manage the hospital, financial management, budgeting. And they also assess how doctors are doing. And they also assess whether different operations in different departments, divisions in a hospital are cost effective or not. That's what health administrators do. That's what they study in college or in grad school. And people also realize that the first three eras lack transparency because nobody collects the data. So we don't know if things improve, remain the same or worsen over time. People don't publish, I mean not people, medical professionals. They don't publish their work, whether they implement this technique in surgery, in diagnosis or whatnot. And they don't say whether it's more effective than the previous techniques or not. But they are strongly encouraged to publish, to present their new techniques, their new procedures in conferences, in journals, articles and whatnot. That's the focus of the fourth era. So things become more transparent as we enter the fourth era. And the big purpose of the fourth era is to improve the life of the providers and patients. But to be honest, I'm sure you know, I'm sure you realize, many medical professionals, especially doctors, they don't like it when they have been evaluated by health administrators. That's human nature, regardless of what our capacities of work. We don't like to be measured to be evaluated. That's our nature. It's not only limited to doctors. Even though the big goal seems ideal to make the lives of doctors and patients better, but doctors resent it when they are being assessed, evaluated. Any questions? So, these are the different characteristics of healthcare under the four different eras. When we were under the professional dominance era, physicians were independent private. They were compensated through fee for service. <coughs> and the American Medical Association is very influential is highly autonomous. They had a lot of power under this era. Before share control happens in the subsequent eras, AMA was very powerful under this era. And healthcare operates under the assumption of Hippocratic Oath. It's characterized by professional trust of doctors, nurses, other medical professionals and medical trust operates under the prerogative of doctors, professional skills and whatnot. They think that the Hippocratic Oath is going to solve everything, it's going to self-regulate. We don't need other outside entities like the government or even the patients 
to have a say in the healthcare. That's the main characteristics of the first era. Are we clear? And it's not perfect. The first era, we saw that. This is how the second era came about. We have Medicare for the elderly and Medicaid for the poor. Federal government had a lot more resources in this era. Right before Vietnam War and right after World War II, they had a lot more resources. Governments in the state, federal and local levels had a lot more resources. And many organizations were established under the federal responsibility eras the Indian Health Services that focus on the healthcare needs, preventive care of Native Americans. They want to help defray the healthcare costs of people from all different walks of life, different racial groups, different age groups, different ethnic groups, different income groups. So they set up the Indian Health Services to focus on the healthcare needs of American Indians or Native Americans. They also established the Department of Health and Human Services with different programs, maternal care, infant care, programs that focus on children. And usually, the Department of Health and Human Services are administered by different states. States have autonomy over the DHHS. I think it's not the federal government's jurisdiction. It's delegated to the state. And we have the NDHHS, the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. Don't believe me? Go Google it. And the US Public Health Services is also established during this time to cater to the different health care needs of people from different walks of life. Remember, government had more resources during this time. So they want to make sure that everybody ideally have equal access to healthcare. Everybody can afford healthcare and everybody can afford a good quality healthcare. That's the focus of the second era. Are we clear? And second era is not perfect. We just saw that from the previous slide. So, because of that, they create a new era with drastic changes. They call that the managed care era. They focus on for profit goals. They let market forces dictate the demand and supply of healthcare services, needs, treatments. They focus on efficiency and cost containment because they think that the federal responsibility era they spend too much money so now they focus on cost effectiveness as they enter the third era and they establish a new system they call that the capitation system where doctors are being paid a set fee to see all the patients cost effectiveness Doctors, if we look at the research being done, doctors resent this system, the capitation system. They don't like it. And as we saw earlier, there are more partnerships and collaborative networks emerging under this era. And under this era, like the two previous eras, patients are passive, they are not empowered. They trust the professional judgment of physicians, medical professionals. They trust the prerogative of medical professionals. They rarely question the doctors or the medical professionals' judgment. When we were in the first three eras, they merely got information from physicians and they do likewise, whether it's prescription or diagnosis or prevention. Patients rarely and employers have a lot of say in insurance coverage. They pay for employees insurance coverage and they became very powerful under this era, the managed care era. 
I'm sure sociologists, I'm sure you know, capitalists, business owners, they try to maximize what? Profits, revenues. They try to minimize what? Cost, right? So employers, like all capitalists, they want to maximize profits. So they limit the coverage options to their employees. They don't think of the well-being of employees at all. The coverage are determined by the labor market conditions and the economic climate, which is not a very good system from the perspective of employees. It benefits the employers, but not employees under this system. And this era focused on accountability for different social insurance programs and accountability in the use of taxpayers' money. Because of that, they want to make healthcare more efficient and cost-contained. They want to be accountable to the different social insurance programs instituted under the Federal Responsibility Era. And they want to be responsible to the taxpayers as well. So this managed care era is very different. They instituted a lot of changes compared to the first two eras. And because employees, they have limited coverage options under this era. Some focus on preventive care to stay healthy and some resort to alternative medicine. Employees or for those who cannot afford insurance, they resort to preventive care and alternative medicine under this era. And as we can all see, this era is not perfect. So they made some drastic significant changes and they created a new era essentially. So the incremental improvement era focused on value-based services. I will show you some examples what is value-based services after this. They focus on quality improvement. They focus more on the patient's perspective, the patient's well-being. Because as we discussed earlier, patients were not empowered, they were passive under the three eras. So they want patients to take a more active role in prevention care, in diagnosis, in treatment, and so on. And they focus on comparative, comparative effectiveness. When we talk about comparative effectiveness, I think they are essentially reimbursing hospital based on maybe how many premature death they can prevent. How long is hospitals readmission? Is that more than a month? If that is so, the hospital is not efficient and effective. This may influence the money hospital get from the state and maybe the federal government. So they compare different hospitals using different measures, number of deaths prevented, number of healthcare associated infections in different hospitals to determine the budget they are going to allocate to different hospitals. And I think the hospital readmission reduction program is also instituted under this era. The Hospital Readmission Reduction Program, or the HRRP, is enacted under the Affordability Care Act (ACA). Have you heard of that Affordability Care Act? And they want to make hospital readmission more efficient, and yet they can prevent death at the same time. Efficient yet of high quality. So, 
they say maybe 30 days is the max for hospital readmission. If somebody gets readmitted due to heart failure, heart attacks or pneumonia, if they stay between a month, they cannot get well between 30 days, the hospital is not efficient. And we are going to impose a financial penalty on those inefficient hospitals. That's the goal of this HRRP program. Just Google that for yourself. So, in this incremental improvements era, they focus on evidence-based medicine. They collect data, they measure everything. They compare everything. They compare which hospital is the most efficient, is the most cost-effective, evidence-based. Which surgical procedures, which techniques used by doctors, medical professionals are the most effective in saving life and in, cut, in cutting costs, evidence-based. And they also focus on clinical research to improve patients' life. And doctors, medical professionals are strongly encouraged to engage in cutting-edge research under this era. And this era takes the patient's experience with the healthcare system into account. They have different patient surveys under this era. Prior to this era, prior to the 21st century, we don't see so much patient surveys. After the 21st century, after the implementation of this incremental improvement era, we see patient surveys bloom like mushrooms conducted by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, a government entity, conducted by different government agencies, conducted by academic researchers, conducted by different research institutes and whatnot. Or some of these surveys are being subcontracted to consulting firms. Patient surveys bloom like mushroom under the fourth era. And patients' preference are taken into account under this era. Any question?